mysteries, anomalies, the extraterrestrial, and the paranormal. Studying the unknown and being studied ourselves. Voices of the Void, a horror game passion project inspired by the successful yet abandoned signal simulator. It's currently being developed by a small yet passionate team, with Mr. Dr. Nonos or Eternity Dev leading the project, along with Monique Sanctifier, the 3D assets artist who also participated in some of the streams. These three, who made the music you hear in the background, along with other members to make up some of the quality of life features of the game, constantly updating and improving it. This isn't Eternity Dev's first game, he has a collection of smaller games under his belt, leading up to Voices of the Void, the most popular and complex of his collection. First appearing on HIO on August 4th, 2022, Voices of the Void revolves around scanning, tracking, downloading, and processing anomalous signals in the deep space, anywhere from planets, moons, stray objects, and things that can't be identified so easily. Despite looking and sounding like Source, The game is actually built in Unreal Engine. From what I was told, these are only temporary until the final release. But I sort of like it. Maybe because the Source Engine itself has transcended to meme status. It tickles me when I run full speed into a wall and get to hear the classic Source ragdoll effect. Ow! I'm not usually one for horror games. <laughs> Holy fuck! That's because most horror games put all their cards on the table way too quickly which kills any of the suspense and fear that most try to build up, turning fear more into frustration. Oh, hello! That was kind of stupid, and I'm dead. I haven't scared of them anymore. It's just, it's annoying. Voices of the Void is different. Everything is very opaque and muddy, and that's a good thing. Everything begins normally, but as the days go on, the game builds up tension, slowly exposing you to different events, entities, and other happenings. And only partially. You might feel like you're being watched. You likely are. But from the shadows, it has no issue telling you that something is there. But no more than that. After watching other creators like Joel and the Librarian play it, okay. oh. I wanted to try it myself. And now, I can't help but cover it. Gate, base... Whiskey. Ooh, whiskey. This is how I ended up in our lovely accommodations. A concrete compound surrounded by satellites deep in the Swiss Alps. This is your home for the next month. Unfortunately, it looks like the previous tenant didn't care for the facility. Fit of laziness. Or maybe craziness. It won't affect our work duties, however, so we'll ignore it for now. At the main computer station, you meet two other characters through emails. Professor Leah and Dr. Bao. Professor Leah is your main supervisor, reminding you of your tasks and giving you a lukewarm welcome. Dr. Bao is your assignment head, essentially your team lead. He will assign you daily tasks to fulfill and reports to complete. He is your primary source of income. For now, you play Dr. Kell, a fresh college graduate and aspiring astronomer, and your duties are as follows. Scan for signals, fulfill reports on satellites, maintain the base and satellite servers, and reset the generators to maintain power at the base. For the love of God, don't forget the generators. No. 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 No, 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 no. Shit. You are the sole worker and caretaker of the array, only maintaining what's necessary and that you send the required data. It's a seemingly simple job. Everything begins at the main station, containing four separate terminals. You first start by pinging and locating signals on the right terminal closest to the computer. Ping with left shift, which will point you in the direction of the nearest signal and the distance from said signal by increasing or decreasing the size of the arrow. The smaller the arrow, the closer the signal. Once you locate a signal, press enter to lock onto it. Once locked on, you move to the terminal opposite of the coordinate terminal. Activate the polarity and frequency filters, then adjust both the frequency and the polarity by holding E on the respective knob and using your mouse wheel to tune in. You may need to switch the polarity channels to find the correct polarity and get any results. It also helps to have an unlockable scroll wheel here. One signal might be in a completely different range than the other. Once you are tuned in, you wait. Once the detector and the downloader at 100%, 
hit the big yellow button to transfer the signal to the next terminal directly to the right. I like to call this the observation terminal, where you can listen and observe the signal you just captured. Unfortunately, it turns out that deep space signals are powered by spectrum. Hence, the quality is hardly discernible from just static. You might be able to barely make something out in the noise, but hardly. So, pop a drive into the terminal, export said signal to the drive, and move across to the processing terminal. Insert the drive into the terminal, import the signal, and hit process. And wait. Again, export the signal back to the drive, move back to the observation terminal, and give it a listen. Congratulations! You have completed your first signal. Now pack it in a box and fulfill your daily assignments. Your equipment will be severely underpowered and slow in the game's early stages. That can be remedied by slowly upgrading the terminals on the computer in the center. Most importantly, higher processing power. And of course, you have to foot the bill. As soon as Dr. Bao finds out you've upgraded the equipment with your own cold hard cash, he has no issue demanding better quality products from you. Freeloader. As I mentioned before, Dr. Bao not only requires a specific set number and quality of signals, but reports to complete. Specifically, satellite hash codes. Not everything can be completed from behind the screens. Sooner or later, you'll have to go outside. Get some much needed vitamin D. Not too much, though. There are 24 satellites around the compound that will need to be regularly maintained and reported on. Each satellite houses a console and a server, both connected to the root server at the base. You can ping, calibrate and track all the satellites using the consoles. However, to complete Dr. Bao's daily report requirements, you must go to the requested satellites and print the hash codes at its own console using sv.hash. Then write the hash code on a piece of paper using the report template, tape it to the top of the box containing the requested drives, and you're all set. Drop into the garage and call for the delivery drone. It should be part of your daily routine to ping servers and add offline servers to your room, and target specific satellites using sv.target and then the server name. Or, you could use the map in the trail guides if you're a masochist. Side note, if you are going to do this, take this map and put it on the other side of the facility. Just trust me on this. Offline servers can be restarted by completing a simple, basic, easy to understand math minigame. Or you can use these purple discs. Please don't tell me you need to use the purple discs. Your first few days of the array will be slow and boring, yet exciting at the same time. Collecting signals, doing some exploring, and maybe even some spring cleaning. That's how I discovered a basement boarded off where I found some more supplies, this old notebook, and this old employee black. Most of your time will be spent repairing servers, filing reports, and collecting drives to complete the daily tasks. I recommend holding off on upgrading your processing level until you can match it with equally powerful upgrades. As I mentioned, Dr. Bao will only request what's possible. As tempting as it is to upgrade so you can clean up signals and discover more, fulfilling orders of higher magnitude becomes a pain when the hamster wheel behind the monitor just isn't fast enough. You should also hold on to drives until you're absolutely sure you can deliver on the order. Daily tasks are due at midnight. As soon as the clock changes over and a new day starts, the daily task is randomized and the order changes. However, suppose you don't have the order ready before 2300. In that case, you might as well hold off on delivering the order since you also need to account for the time it takes for the drone to arrive, pick it up, and then fly it back to headquarters. Trust me, I learned this the hard way. You'll still get paid for your delivery, but you'll also get an email from Dr. Bao scolding you for delivering the wrong drives and the wrong report, and you'll have to start from scratch, recollecting drives and venturing out to satellites to get more hash codes. In your free time, between your work duties, take some time to explore the compound grounds. Anytime it just jumps, that's it. That's all she wrote. Ow. 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 Exploring the area around the facility is equally important as analyzing the ever-growing darkness of the cosmos. The trees hold just as many secrets as space. While exploring, you'll discover things such as this hole. Or this hole. Which I spent an overly long time trying to steal this generator out of and this dirt mount, where I dug a hole and found this piece of scrap metal. Of course, there's more than just holes around the complex. Some finds, lighthearted in nature, others... I'm not so sure. I found what appeared to be a cabinet that these tiles fit into. It looks like it takes nine tiles hidden around the map to open, but I never found them all. What's in there remains a mystery to me. 
I also found this hatch that is, unfortunately at the time of filming this video, isn't complete yet. So this remains unsolved. For now. Of course, being a caretaker of the satellite array also includes caring for the caretaker. That's you. At the time of writing and making this video in version 0.6.1, player damage isn't fully implemented. Even when toggled in the menu, Dr. Kell is extremely resilient. That's not to say you can neglect your necessities, food, and sleep. While you can't die, for the most part, you will suffer from the consequences. Once your food meter drops to around 20, you'll begin to trip, fall, and forget how to run, and hallucinate burgers, worsening until you're an unstable mess. The raining burgers aren't a gift either, a get out of hunger free card. Any attempt to satiate yourself with a spectral burger will leave you sad and hungry, watching them disappear before your very eyes. Don't worry, the boys back at the lab know you're not a machine and will deliver a delectable veggie omelette MRE and a drive to remind you what you're worth. Whatever you do, any morsel of food you find, stored in the fridge, I don't care if it's sealed MREs, nothing is safe from the cockroaches. They eat everything. Everything. They ate my noodles. My McNuggets. They ate my cat. They ate my fucking cat. Choosing not to sleep will start to cause your camera to sway at around 20. Again, you can't sprint, you may begin to see things out of the corner of your vision. Don't fret too much though. Eventually, sleep will come. Someone will be there to tuck you in. Currently, there aren't any other types of self-care you need to worry about. No need for hygiene. You are isolated, after all. Who's gonna judge you? No water. We live on a strict coffee supplement. There's no need to care for your sanity, either. I'm sure it's structurally sound. Your first few hours in the game will be slow. It won't take too long before you find yourself in a loop as you work to collect more credits. Dare I say, monotonous. It's a job, after all. The signal analysis is great and all, but there's not much to discover with low-level equipment at the start. Thankfully, you could save signals to process later if you encounter something interesting. In any other game, I would chalk this up to bland mechanics, but here, at least in the early game, I think it's intentional. Being introduced to the dark, empty, and cold feeling of the concrete structure of the base with its bare necessities and nothing more definitely gave an eerie, isolated feeling. All the mannequins and human remains set the tone right off the bat. But as you settle in and get to work, you start to warm up to your new home, tune out the situational awareness, you end up forgetting that it's also part horror game. So right when you're feeling comfortable and you have a routine down, you get a not so subtle reminder that things aren't so simple. All those mannequins around the facility? I hope you sleep well tonight. Meet your stalkers. One will appear, then two, then four. I'm not sure if they're limited by the number of mannequins on the map or if they continue to multiply, but they just keep coming. No matter how many times I destroy them. As far as I know, they aren't hostile, just creepy and unsettling upon first contact. More obnoxious and annoying in later gameplay. The best way to get them to leave you alone is by lighting them on fire, so you should most definitely try that and stop asking questions. The stalker acts as a tipping point. Your experience becomes more bizarre as time goes on. You'll have the pleasure and misfortune of meeting all the fine residents of the satellite array. Unfortunately for most of them, my interactions were usually after the isolation and cabin fever long set in. Fine. The world itself will also like to toy with you. Some events are tied to signals, so if you want to experience the most out of your gameplay, it's important to balance your outside exploration and the signal analysis. Especially since signals are randomized, with some being rarer than others. All of your signals come from here. Monique mentioned a Wheel of Fortune style thing under the map. I thought it was a joke, but sure enough, there it is. If it seems like I'm being a bit cryptic about Voices of the Void, that's because I am. Honestly, it's hard to write about a game when the whole purpose of it is to be shrouded in mystery. But I love the concept, exploring the depths of something right in front of our very eyes. I can't describe the feeling, I'm not sure if there's a word for it, but locking onto a signal, processing it, and listening to it, all while looking out the window and into the sky as you do, you can't see it, you can hardly comprehend it, but something is out there, trying to get your attention, and any other day, you would miss it, you wouldn't even give it a thought making you wonder what you aren't hearing or seeing. When you look deep into space, 
Is something looking back? Is something talking back? Is a singular person? We'll never know. I think the best way to describe this feeling is looking down from the sky to the water below. This might sound convoluted and maybe a bit dark, so bear with me. Something I enjoy from time to time is magnet fishing. Pulling discarded items from the dark waters destined to be long forgotten on the muddy river floor. It's just kind of interesting. But then you hear about people discovering sunken cars or boats with people that have been missing for weeks, months, sometimes even years, right under our noses. It's a strange feeling I can't quite explain. Fear of the unknown, but less fear and more curiosity. Something right in front of our faces, but almost entirely out of our minds. Whenever we look into the cold, murky waters, our minds wandering with trivial thoughts. Could something be looking back? Begging to be discovered? When we gaze at the stars, is something staring back down at us? One might ponder these things as you sit at your workstation, listening in on the far out broadcasts of the universe. We'll have plenty of time. Just you and your thoughts. You and the Aurarials. Don't ask who those are. You'll learn soon enough. Instead, start to ask the more pertinent questions. Who am I working for? What are we looking for? Does any single do? Or is there something specific that the scientists are looking for? Why does Dr. Bao ask for such specific drives when the rest of the scientists are okay with anything I sent? Why am I paying for better equipment? Why are there human remains in and around the base? Has anyone from the science team come out here? Or are we all just pawns? Taking each other's place as we disappear. Is there an end goal? Or are we just destined to listen to the vacuum of space until it consumes us? Well, I can answer that last one at least. There isn't a canon ending to Voices of the Void. At least not now. It is possible to lose by finding and processing a specific signal. But until you find that, you continue to process signals and go on with your day-to-day -day duties. So what is it that you're working towards? Sandbox mode. Oh, see you losers later. I'm off to do better things now. You unlock sandbox mode after playing 31 successful days in the story mode. Sure, you do have to start over, but that only means new opportunities. A chance to take our previous experiences and learning opportunities and use them to build a scientific empire. Or at least try to do better. Thanks to an extensive catalog of different props and decorations, we can now turn this dilapidated concrete compound into a respectable establishment. Long gone are the days of discarded Chinese takeout and the deafening drone of silence. We now have access to proper cleaning equipment and the finest entertainment money can buy. And it will remain this way, no matter what. With a single button press, we instantly convert to top-of-the-line equipment without spending a single dime. And, with a seemingly infinite source of revenue, we can employ unpaid servants to maintain our satellite servers, leaving us more than enough time to focus on completing Dr. Bao's requests. But why should I? I can expedite my entire process and cut Bao out of the equation. I'm no longer an employee of this company, but a contractor. It's time we become independent. This is what Voices of the Void is all about. Sure, it's also about being spooky and mysterious, but the real goal is becoming a master in your field. Not just meeting the expectations of your scientist cohorts, but excelling beyond them and driving your stake into the program. I have to give the devs props. This is a solid game and it really carries the spirit of indie game development. It has a very lively community and the team is super active within it. It really shows that both are having fun with the development process. I can't wait to see where they go from here as they work towards their final release. As I mentioned before, the game is currently on itch.io if you want to give it a try. The game can be downloaded for free, but I definitely recommend giving some support if you can. They've earned it. I will be back to visit this game once it's fully released. And you will see it again on the channel once it does. After all, the Department of Universal Cosmic Collections needs to grow somehow. You know, the game kind of reminds me of something else I covered. Receive an order, use four different stations to complete it, then send it out to be judged on your performance. Honestly, plays like a Papa's game. In fact, the crossovers are sort of uncanny. The random burgers around the world need to buy our own upgrades. My employment situation is also a bit iffy and questionable. 
The online menu is full of the same selections. Jesus Christ, you don't think that... Ah, I forgot the fucking Transformers again. Who's there? Louie, is that you? Hey, uh, you know I put in my two weeks, right? I left on good terms. I know you aren't happy about me leaving, but you and I both know I wasn't made for the fast food. 